Listeners, readers, welcome to the Foxed page, where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. One-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, best-selling author, and a podcaster who is coming to you today from her pantry because we are diving into the super great, very, very popular lessons in chemistry. Couple of notes. One is that um, everybody was reading lessons in chemistry, and I had a couple of different readers say things to me along the lines of like, I'm not sure it's up to your standards, or I don't really think you would like it. And frankly, uh, I was pretty happy to dismiss it because I had seen the American version of the book. I had seen the cover art. And it was uh, so kind of of a piece for me with a bunch of these titles that have come out. It reminded me a little bit of like, Where'd You Go Bernadette, which I actually really liked. Uh, but there's there's a certain cover of book that is looking quite a bit uh, like a whole bunch of other covers of books. And for some reason, uh, it just did not appeal. I also, of course, had these different people saying like, I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's really like up your alley. Um, but then I saw the television trailer. So everybody who uh, has listened at all to the podcast here knows that I love television. So so when I saw the version of it on the television, I saw Brie Larson, I saw just kind of the general feel of it. I watched the trailer. Of course, I can't remember the trailer now, but um, I, I was kind of drawn in. I have to say I wasn't drawn in enough to actually go buy the book or, frankly, to watch the show on television. But then I happened to be in London and I saw this um, actually in a hotel library which um, I think they invited you maybe to take it. I'm not totally sure. I did um, go ahead and take it. I also left behind um, an extra copy that I had of one of my uh, Claire Keegan Foster books. So I feel like that was actually a really good trade for them. But I was really drawn in by this cover, the UK cover. And uh, for those of you who are watching the YouTube channel, I'm just gonna take the, the sort of dust cover, the dust jacket off here and show you also the super cute, um, what is this? This is like, you know, the interior cover of the book, which I really liked. Obviously this is the periodic table. I have one child who one time in fifth grade did his passion project on not just the uh, periodic table, but in fact, the noble gases in the periodic table. This makes that child sound like a total nerd. Um, and he's, you know, it's a pretty decent nerd, but not like a total, total nerd. Did not turn out to be a chemist. Um, so all of that is a long-winded way of saying that this UK version of the book was appealing to me. I guess it's also a way of saying that I am really easily swayed, apparently, by uh, by the covers of books, which I think is not maybe a bad thing. Oh my gosh, I just almost dropped like a whole pile of plates over here. Sorry. Again, I just mentioned that I am coming, I'm beaming into you uh, from my pantry. I had a listener recently who was like, sometimes in the podcast, you refer to things that I can see. And I don't really understand why, because it's just a podcast. And I'm like, oh, it is so much more than a podcast. No, I'm just kidding. That is not what I said to her. What I said to this listener is like, oh, actually, there's also a YouTube channel. So you can just watch the lecture. And part of me wonders like why people would want to do that, uh, you know, more than just like to get a glimpse maybe of the background. But you would actually be shocked at how many people are tuning into the YouTube channel. I have so many subscribers. It's very exciting to me. And people like actually watch the whole entire thing. And there's like comments. I mean, not a lot, but like it's starting people. It's happening. And actually also on the YouTube channel, I kind of pepper in uh, images here and there, which is really fun for me. And I would imagine maybe that adds a little extra something. I'm also imagining that when people are watching the YouTube channel, they're not just sitting in front of it. I think that they're probably like, I don't know, they have it on perhaps when they're cooking, which is a perfect segue into lessons in chemistry. So we're gonna go ahead and dive in. Um, I was drawn to it again because of the UK cover and also because of the television. I have not watched the show yet, but I'm so excited. I also plan to uh, get back to you with a different podcast about the television series because I'm very interested in uh, the different ways that they might adapt this content and the different ways that they might sort of move given the feminism and given the era and given a bunch of different things. 
the other thing that I can report certainly is that although this book in some ways didn't maybe like rise to some of my literary standards, it really hit all the marks for the kind of book it is. It's incredibly entertaining. It's warming. It's inspirational. It is sad at times. Certainly it's really wide sweeping. A lot is going on. It's very well structured. And what we're going to do today is dive into all of the reasons why I think it's definitely worth reading. Um, and also we're going to talk about some of the points um, that, that I found maybe not quite as impressive. And actually that exercise is always very interesting uh, to me as a reader and hopefully to you as a listener and a reader. And certainly for anyone out there in the uh, Fox Page universe who is an aspiring writer, it's excellent to listen to um, someone do a little analysis of maybe the weaker points of a novel, because I think that's one of the best ways that we can learn and move forward. So for all of you out there who love an agenda, today we're going to talk about the narrative voice, this very nimble and I think very um, strong narrative voice and the ways in which it's really working well. We're gonna talk about some of the other strengths of the prose. We're going to talk about pacing, so um, Bonnie Garmus, which um, we're not going to spend much time talking about Bonnie Garmus, um, I, you know, just because we have other things to talk about. I mean, she seems great. The rowing thing, I don't get. I just am like, oh, anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the really, as really amazing aspects of the prose. Then we're going to talk about feminism in the book, which is obviously a very uh, large aspect of the book. We're going to talk about um, few, a few of the really excellent aspects of the book that aren't just to do with the prose, but sort of structure and things. We're going to talk about the weaknesses that I, that I ferreted out, and then we are going to uh, close. We're going to talk about the ending of, of the book. Okay, so Bonnie Garmus, everything that I know about her comes uh, from this flap on the UK edition. It says she's a copywriter, creative director, she's worked in um, science, she's a rower, and also like a hiker. Oh no, God, she's a long distance swimmer. Um, I mean, this is a woman, or like an open water swimmer or something. Um, she was born in California and then lived in Seattle, from what I can tell, and then lived in London, uh, or now lives in London. I will say from the jacket copy there, uh, there are two little aspects that I will note. One is that um, there were a couple of Britishisms. There were a couple of kind of anglicized, uh, like British American uh instances of dialogue in the book, which just kind of, um, I don't know, part of me was like, ooh, ooh Bonnie, I think maybe uh, you're letting the, the London kind of slip in to this very California-based book. Um, just a couple, just a couple little things, no big deal. Also because I was very attuned to that because I happened to be in London at the time. Um, the other thing is her dog named 99, I think that's the name of her dog, and then the dog named 630 uh, in the book, those were, I have to say, I, I just found it like a bit too cute. That was one of those um, aspects where I was like, oh no, like this is, this is not, this is not really like impressing me. A lot of the book did impress me, but the name of the dog I just found too cute, which is kind of ironic because I am someone whose dog's names are actually like probably too cute also. That's a little teaser. I'm not going to tell you what my dog's names are. You'll just have to uh, wait for another episode. I'll let you know later. Okay. Now we're going to dive in now that we've done a very quick, I mean, speaking of Bonnie Garmus though, that woman is psyched. Like this is a book that I think, you know, she's had this broad, you know, um, range of jobs that she has done. And this book is really, really doing well. And then of course the television um, rights, which she sold are obviously um, really paying a dividend. So I am very impressed with Bonnie Garmus and I'm very happy for her. Is that even her name? Garmus? Yes. Bonnie Garmus. Okay, so now we are going to dive in. I talked a little bit about the cover art. Maybe you know that kind of stylized cover that I'm talking about, or maybe it's just that I got kind of tired of this kind of style of cover art. Um, I really do like the title. So Lessons in Chemistry, it seems pretty straightforward. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. At one point, there is verbatim mention. Um, I think it's at the end of one of her um, television shows. Elizabeth Zott says something like, and the, that's your chemistry lesson for today. 
you know, class dismissed or something. Um, but I like the idea of chemistry as really being the most important aspect. Chemistry is, you know, right there in uh, the title. So the emphasis is squarely on the science, which I think is very appropriate and very inspirational in some ways. I also like the idea of lessons because, um, you know, we're all learning here. Uh, Elizabeth Zott is learning there. And obviously these lessons are not just science lessons. They are in fact life lessons that everyone is acquiring throughout the novel. I also liked, um, I will admit, it is uh, early December and I was recently watching someone make the most incredible Christmas toffee. I was sitting at his breakfast bar, just like kicking back, enjoying some tea and watching him do a lot of hard work. And I was asking some questions uh, about caramelization of sugar. And he was like, what is this, lessons in chemistry? And I actually hadn't finished the book yet. And I um, also just like haven't watched the television. So I didn't really get the reference, but I do like the idea that lessons in chemistry is is something that people are perhaps applying to their experiences in the kitchen um which i really which i really love one aspect i really did like about the text is the fact that each of the chapters has this really um sort of delightful way that we have sometimes a chapter title and often um if not always i think maybe uh, a time stamp and i like a time stamp because it's a very efficient and very easy way for an author to signal to us you know exactly where we are in time. It's important in this book in particular because uh, the structure of this book is great. We begin with Madeline or Madeline maybe um, given the spelling. Um, we begin with Madeline whose real name is just Mad of course which I found that a little bit too cute also when they were asking about the baby's name and Elizabeth Zott said Mad because she was feeling mad at the time as an angry. Um, that felt a little too cute to me too. It's kind of like the dog name thing. Like, I don't even remember what they said about 6.30. They found him at 6.30 or something. Um, but th those, just a tiny, tiny bit, tiny bit too cute for me. But we begin with Madeline at the very beginning in November of 1961, importantly, and uh, Elizabeth Zott is having a hard, hard time. And then the story goes back in time. So the fact that we have these timestamps is a very efficient and very um, like generous way for an author to help us out um, as, we're, as we're moving through uh, a novel that has any kind of complexity in its structure. We are going to dive in here, um, chapter one, November 1961. Back in 1961, when women wore shirtwaist dresses and joined garden clubs and drove legions of children around in seatbeltless cars without giving it a second thought, back before anyone knew there'd be a 60s movement, much less one that its participants would spend the next 60 years chronicling, back when the big wars were over and the secret wars had just begun and people were starting to think fresh and believe everything was possible, the 30-year-old mother of Madeline Zott rose before dawn every morning and felt certain of just one thing, her life was over. Okay, a couple of things. So um, we're really leaning hard into 1961, November 1961, back in 1961, chapter one, we've got all of this kind of beginning stuff. We're at the beginning of a new decade. It's important to remember that this is situated at the end of the 50s, and there is a lot of change that is in store. Um, but I have to say that the emphasis, like kind of the bulk of this paragraph is taken up by the notion of this 60s movement, which is about to occur, and it is going to be chronicled for the next 60 years by, by you know, the people who live through it. I, that felt to me a bit distracting. And frankly, if I were editing Bonnie Grimes, I might suggest that we omit some of that because the rest of what she's talking about here is really very interesting to me. But again, um, I'm not sure why we have emphasis on the 60s when in fact they're, they're, they haven't happened yet and they're not particularly germane. Um, the civil rights movement, I think, is germane. But beyond that, you know, the sort of hippie thing is not not really what we are talking about here. Um, I mean, of course, we're talking about the women's movement, but we're not really talking about, I think when we think of the 60s, people think of free love and, you know, hippies and Woodstock and all of that kind of stuff. I guess, you know, women's lib and bra burning and all of that too, but um, it, it feels a little bit sort of like a misemphasis here. 
Um, but I do like the beginning part because we have this nice emphasis on what women were doing. So women are wearing shirtwaist dresses, which is such an interesting note because, you know, a shirtwaist dress, it's like, it's kind of like a man's shirt, but that has been made into a dress. So you can sort of see it as a symbol in some ways of sort of women moving out of the more kind of you know, dresses only moment and more out of the kind of domestic, like women have to look like 1950s poodle skirts type of thing and moving more toward, uh, you know, being able to wear a, like a button down shirt. So I think that's a very nice detail and a very nice evocation. Um, joining the garden club, driving around in the seat beltless cars seems a little more to me like a 70s kind of a thing. Um, when you have legions of children, I think that's what threw me off because I pictured myself in the back of our Country Squire station wagon with the wood paneling, um, you know, on the way to Lake Tahoe with a big mattress in the back, lying horizontally in like the perfect position to have all of our like, you know, spines all just like concertinaed when we got in a car crash. Um, but in the it's sort of end of the 50s, early 60s, I'm thinking more of like a, you know, two kid family and the two car garage and all of that kind of stuff. So there are a couple of things at the beginning here that are feeling like maybe Bonnie Garmus hasn't quite found her footing. I'm also interested in back when the big wars were over and the secret wars had just begun. So that was kind of interesting to me because at first I was like, okay, secret wars, are we talking about like McCarthyism? Are we talking about the rise of communism? Um, you know, are we talking about Vietnam? Are we talking about um, the Cold War? Like, what exactly are we talking about? Felt maybe like a little bit too secretive the way that she is stating it there. But I did like that kind of intrigue. But I, I also really appreciated the way that we are moving from sort of these women who are joining their garden clubs. Then we have this kind of somewhat wider expanse of what is happening in the country. And then we're moving closer to the mother of Madeline Zott. So, I do think it's interesting that the beginning, we're really focused on Madeline here. And I think um, kind of the, the most sort of flattering and generous interpretation is that one of the things that uh, Elizabeth Zott is fighting for here is legacy. And she's fighting for, you know, children, uh, young girls in particular, to grow up um, in somewhat sort of less conventional ways and um, sort of, you know, inspiring them to defy sexual stereotypes and gender stereotypes and to become scientists, not just homemakers. But I do think um, that having the emphasis and describing her as Madeline Zott's mother is kind of interesting because she is maternal in some ways, but not not in the kind of standard ways we think of. Um, Madeline, I mean, Elizabeth Zott is not particularly maternal in the sense of being really nurturing or very much sort of uh, in touch with her daughter's body or being sort of, um, you know, free and open with her daughter. She's writing all of those notes every day, but they tend to be, um, you know, fairly clinical in lots of ways, also pretty dark in lots of ways, but I, I loved them. I mean, I really, I, I really admire a lot about Elizabeth Zott, but I do think it's an interesting choice at the beginning here for Bonnie Garmus to be um, sort of really emphasizing the fact that she is a mother at the beginning. Of course, that's a structural choice also, though, because we're building up this intrigue of like, wait, how does she have this three-year-old daughter or four-year-old daughter, I guess? Um, how does she have this four-year-old daughter and, and sort of who is this woman and, you know, how as we get deeper into the story, as we go back in time and we realize that she is this chemist and she doesn't want children, you know, in the back of your mind, you're like, but wait, she's about to have, uh, you know, this child. So there, there is a really nice amount of tension that is set up, but it is a very deliberate and kind of interesting choice, I think, on the part of Garmus. Okay, we're going to read uh, just the next two paragraphs. So again, that last sentence was that she was certain of one thing, her life was over. Kind of a dark start, but of course I love a dark start. Despite that certainty, she made her way to the lab to pack her daughter's lunch. So I love this. One of the notes that I made in the back are all the different ways that the domestic sphere, the private sphere, the home sphere becomes public or is sort of invaded by the public or is repurposed in ways that suit Elizabeth Zott. So we have this kind of shaping of the domestic toward the scientific or toward the professional that is so cool. So basically Elizabeth Scott I mean, Elizabeth Zott is transforming the heart of kind of domesticity, 
you know, the woman is meant to provide children, historically, of course, meant to provide children and meant to nurture and, um, you know, nur by nurture, I mean, like, uh, you know, provide nutrients for the family. So you have her taking this very kind of domestic space, which is the kitchen, you know, the heart of the home, all of that kind of stuff. And she is essentially turning it into a place of scientific research, and she is, in fact, running a business out of her house. So we see this awesome entrance of the public and of the professional into the domestic and the private right from the start. But it's a little confusing in it, kind of an awesome way when we have this thing about how she makes her way to the lab to pack her daughter's lunch. It's a little disconcerting because you're like, wait, what kind of a lab are we talking about? And in fact, we are talking about this um, lab that she herself constructed when she was pregnant, which is all very significant. You know, she's preparing to have a baby. So in some ways she should be kind of nesting. And in fact, what she is doing is like physically and single-handedly transforming the domestic space into a, a place of, of scientific inquiry. It's pretty, pretty great. Okay, and then, um, fuel for learning, Elizabeth Zott wrote on a small slip of paper before tucking it into her daughter's lunchbox. Then she paused, her pencil in midair, as if reconsidering. Play sports at recess, but do not automatically let the boys win, she wrote on another slip. Then she paused again, tapping her pencil against the table. It is not your imagination, she wrote on the third. Most people are awful. She placed the last two on top. So again, this is pretty dark. First of all, she's convinced her life is over and the note that she is giving to her very young daughter, um, is she three years old? Um, do we know yet? I'm trying to look here, I'm looking back. Um, we don't actually know. I think she's four at this point or five maybe because she's off in um, like kindergarten or first grade. Um, but but we have these notes that where she is saying to her daughter, people are awful. I mean, this is not, it's not an overly optimistic start. And I actually really appreciate that. So this is not a bad time to take um, just a just a like tiny step back and think about the book in slightly more broad terms, which is this. The, the main character here, Elizabeth Zott, who is our heroine in lots of ways, although we have a really kind of deceptively wide cast of characters who are well fleshed out and really interesting and compelling people. But this Elizabeth Zott, who's kind of the heart uh, and, the, and the sort of the main you know protagonist in our book here, is someone who is um, a little difficult to know. She's a little prickly, she's a little awkward, she is not funny, she never smiles, she's not warm, um, she is a little cautious, she's definitely a little bit on the uh, pessimistic side, and for good reason, she's had a hard time. She's grown up with a weird family, her brother committed suicide, she feels very responsible for all of these different tragedies that have befallen her. But the whole time I was like, oh gosh, please don't turn her into some sunny, happy, um, you know, kind of bubbly personality on television. And I also was so worried that Bonnie Garmas um, was going to somehow make this into a rom-com where Elizabeth Zott ended up finding true love again. So um, maybe I won't spoil it for you, but I will say that I was very satisfied with the ending of the book, with how things turned out. And again, that is very much to Garmus's credit because we really do care about Elizabeth Zott and we are rooting for her and we have compassion for her, but she's not someone who's just kind of like super likable, which is really, a, a, it's an impressive feat, frankly. I'm also really excited to see how Brie Larson plays this character in the television series. And I'm really excited to see, um, you know, sort of how likable she is and whether or not we stay true to form in the sense that Elizabeth Zott is very reserved and prickly and difficult to know and very private and very, um, you know, sort of flat affect is what is what I might say. Okay, so we've completed our little introduction. We've looked at this very first page of the of the novel. Now we're going to move on to talk kind of briefly about this narrative voice. As we are talking about all of these different elements, of course, we are also going to be looking at the excellent prose that you will find in this book. But I was very impressed with the narrative voice. So 
point of view and narrative voice can be very straightforward in different works. I'm, I'm reading Claire Keegan right now, and I have been reading her um, recently, and she does a very omniscient third-person narrator that's really impressive, but in some ways, it's a more sort of straightforward point of view or narrative stance. And I mean, that can be very difficult to do, and it can be incredibly beautiful. But I was very impressed with Bonnie Garmus's ability to have this very nimble, close third um, narrator. So a close third is simply, the whole book is in a third person narrative voice. So it just means that we are saying, you know, Elizabeth did this and Madeline did that and Harriet did this and 69, what's his name? It's not 69, 630, 69. You know, I'm a little bit weirdly obsessed with that uh, number, it seems. So, but 630, you know, the, they're doing these different things. It's never I did this or you did that. It's always safely, it's always consistently in the third person. But it is what we can, what we call a close third. Sometimes it's called free indirect discourse or indirect style, which means that the narrator, the third person narrator is entering into the thoughts of different characters. It's sometimes hard to pull off, but Garmus does it really well. I think the book is um, is sort of light and it's sort of uh, uh, sort of frothy in a way that is really um, very effective. But I think it can kind of convince you uh, th that that it's lighter than it actually is. It's a pretty long book. I mean, it's almost four hundred pages, and it really covers a lot of terrain. And again, there are tons of characters who are well fleshed out. And part of the reason why I think Garmus is able to um, you know conserve this kind of light tone. I don't think anyone's going to say like, oh, it's a very difficult book to read and it's very compelling and you want to keep reading and, and you're certainly not feeling like it's dragging or it's slow. At least I didn't. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with this really nimble, um, very sort of apt and, and, and very well done narrative voice. So in the beginning, um, we have this omniscient narrator who is saying back in 1961 when women wore shirtwaist dresses, you know, you have this very sort of the lens is pulled way back and then we get closer and we are inside the mind of uh, Elizabeth Zott. We know her at that point as the mother of Madeline Zott. And what she knows, which we, we are inside her thoughts because we are being told what she knows, which is that her life is over. So right from the beginning, we have this narrator that can be both very sort of far away and distant, describing things in very general tones, and then terms general terms, and then also can really be uh, very close to the consciousness of a certain character. So um, I want to look at a couple of instances of this just because I do think it's very well done. On page 95, this is after the terrible car crash, and um, on the end of 95 it says, with his head down, he turned and went to give Elizabeth the bad news. So one of the things that I, do, I think that um, Elizabeth does well, and I mean, I'm going to keep doing that, but that Bonnie Garmus does well, is um, is entering into the consciousness of the dog. There are a couple of times where it seems a little bit too cute to me, but I do like it. It reminded me of this incredible movie that I really love called Beginners. Um, it's with Ewan McGregor and Christopher Plummer. It's so good. I think it's, it's not Mike Mills. Maybe it is. Yeah, I think it's Mike Mills. Anyway, it's great. But there's a dog in that, a Jack Russell Terrier, who can sort of speak he doesn't actually speak and he probably doesn't know as many words um but they do a beautiful beautiful job of uh having the dog be sort of somewhat verbal in that movie and i'm really interested to find out if 630 is in fact a presence in the television show and how much they make of that but i think for the most part the dog's role um is is pretty great and in fact he plays kind of a large role because we see him uh he and elizabeth are the ones who close the novel which obviously is giving him sort of pride of place. Okay, we're gonna look at 98. So this is very interesting. This is during um, the actual, during the funeral. And um, it's, it's uh, we have almost what feels like sort of a Greek chorus thing happening here. She, again, this very nimble narrator is able to actually enter into sort of the minds of groups of people and speak, you know, sort of of the, of the group. Uh, so we have things like, as the scientists milled about, several noticed Zot way off in the distance, the dog by her side. Once again, the damn dog wasn't on a lead. Same old, same old. Even in death, Zot and Evans acted as if the rules didn't apply to them. 
So again, you have this um, th this notion of sort of sour grapes, certainly on the part of all of these other scientists. But I think it's a very uh, it's a very deft way that um, we are beginning, first of all, to have sympathy for Zot and Evans, and quite a bit of antipathy for the scientists who are there, um, who are really chauvinist and misogynist and really not great uh, people there at Hastings. So we we have this really efficient way because she allows us to enter into sort of the group mind of the people at the lab in this really excellent way. Um, okay, we're going to look at 148. So this is Harriet, and I loved Harriet as a character. So um, this is uh, when, when this is Harriet relatively early on. She wanted to believe that someday she would recommit to her goal to be in love, real love. So we have this kind of nice dipping into her uh, into her consciousness, and it's a very sort of sincere and kind of um, sweet thing. It's the very end of that chapter that she says she wants to recommit to this goal of finding real love. And then um, right across on the next page, um, which is the beginning of chapter 18, we have the narrator pull back. So we have just been inside Harriet's you know, mind and we've, we're hearing about this sort of profound goal that she has. And then we have this next sentence. Harriet Sloan had never been pretty, but she'd known pretty people and they always seemed to attract trouble. So um, I like this because the, 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 um, the narrator here, the, the narrative stance is kind of shifting more toward a general third person, but it's still very close to Harriet. So we still are kind of thinking about her ideas, but we have um, a little bit of an external vision of her. She's not pretty. Um, I do, you know, now that I have finished the book, I love uh, what happens for Harriet during the course of the book. And what I can tell you is that um, the Harriet storyline made me extra happy because I was really hoping that that was not going to be the storyline for Elizabeth Zott herself. So I was kind of doubly happy for Harriet because she, she saved us from kind of a schmaltzy, a schmaltzy ending. But again, we have this very deft way of sort of learning about this goal that this woman has and then the narrator kind of pulling the camera back and showing us her physicality and, and a couple of other things about her. So, and Garmus does this again and again. We have Miss Trask, we have the internal voice of, of her, we have the dog, we have all these different characters. We have um, Weekly, we have Wilson, maybe not Wilson, we have certainly, we have Calvin Evans, we have all of these different people. Um, we're entering into their minds, certainly Avery Parker. Um, they're just lots and lots of different people whose, whose consciousness we enter in a way that is very revealing and very satisfying. Okay. Um, we're going to look at 217. So here on 217, we have another example of, of, the, uh, of the narrator, our narrative stance, our, our sort of our nimble third person narrator, entering into the mind of someone who we don't even really know. These are all of the different women who are watching Elizabeth Zott on television. And Garmus does this cool thing where she kind of pops out of you know the studio and what's happening in the studio and she enters into the lives of these women who are you know harried mothers at home who are the people who are viewing her show. Sometimes I found it a little heavy-handed because the women would be discussing things like you know, um, I don't know, like the centigrade equivalent of blah, 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 or like the number of, you know, I don't know, Bunsen, I, not, I, I can't think of an example right now, but they, they were having these very elevated discussions of chemistry that didn't quite work for me. Okay, so on page 217, we are entering into um, the minds of one of these viewers. Oh, for heaven's sake, Petey, a harried woman said, coming into the room, her wet hands holding a half-peeled potato, the baby crying in the high chair in the kitchen. Do I have to do everything for you? But as she reached to turn Elizabeth off, Elizabeth spoke to her. So it's this beautiful thing where we have, we know Elizabeth well, we know Elizabeth's trials and tribulations, and then we have her connecting with this totally anonymous woman, this kind of one-off reaction on the part of this one woman. Obviously, then the reader is able to sort of imagine the legions of women, first in Southern California and then syndicated across the United States, who are responding so well to what Elizabeth is, uh, you know, what, what, she's, what she's selling. Okay, good. And then we are going to look at 375. 
the reason I wanted to read this one little clip on 375 is that this is an example of how this kind of nimble narrator is so efficient in terms of really allowing us to get to know characters. Um, I'll say it yet again, this is a really wide cast of characters and you do have a sense that you know all of these people fairly well. And the reason why I think Garmus is able to pull that off is because of this nimble narrator who steps into the consciousnesses of these people. So we have Avery Parker, who is, you know, kind of late to the party here, um, on 375. Distracted, Avery reached up and touched her finger to the cheap daisy brooch. What a foolish woman she'd been. Buying Hastings, coming out here, meeting Zot. She'd once dreamed of becoming a scientist herself. But instead, she'd been raised to be one thing and one thing only. Nice. So this is so good because, again, this is this really great example of how this nimble narrator is really allowing us to know this woman who we wouldn't really know very well otherwise because she is coming sort of late on the scene and yet she is a very, very important character. It's just really well done. So we've talked about narrative voice, this very nimble way that the narrator can enter into these different people's uh, consciousnesses. Another element that's kind of a structural element of the book that I think is very successful is the pacing. So pacing is simply, um, you know, it's, it's the way, it's the, the sort of manner in which an author will meet out information. But pacing is very, very difficult, and you might never really have thought much about it or noticed it because writers who are good are very good at it. But if you'll, you know, if you're reading something and you'll feel like something's going a little bit too long or you'll be like, wait a minute, how are we all of a sudden here? Those are examples of pacing that's not working particularly well. But we have this really, um, this good structure where we're beginning with Madeline in uh, November of 1961 and then we're going back in time. So we're covering quite a bit of, of ground throughout the novel and the way that, um, that, that Garmus does the pacing allows us to cover lots and lots of years and have lots and lots of characters without feeling like things are dragging. So on page six, uh, this is when she's first meeting Walter Pine, which is interesting. It's fun to go back and look at the beginning of the book because this is a scene that we see not too far in the book when she kind of gets her television gig, but we we are, you know, we're, we revisit it when she actually agrees. But at this point, we're seeing kind of the heat of the moment. Um, and it's, it's very well done. The structure of the book is excellent and it also allows, um, part of the reason it's excellent is because of the pacing. So she's gone in to, to say that Amanda needs to stop stealing um, the delicious lunches that she sends with Madeline. As she turned to leave, Pine, not wanting her to go, or fully understanding what he was about to hatch, said quickly, wait, please just stop, please. What, what was that thing you just said about teaching the whole nation how to make food that matters? Supper at six debuted four weeks later. So that's such a, that's like kind of a baller move, really, to be able to, to like have this, um, ha like have you kind of immersed in a scene and then say, Supper at Six debuted four weeks later. You, you're jumping a whole month and lots of stuff has to happen in order for that to happen seamlessly. And lots of stuff is going to happen, but it's really deft and it's very flattering to the reader. And again, it's kind of a sophisticated move on the part of Bonnie Garmus. Again, it just, it's very satisfying to not have to like um, expect lots and lots of scenes. Speaking of being satisfied, I mentioned earlier the fact that I'm not um, the rowing stuff. I mean, I liked learning about it a little bit, but it just is not something that I'm particularly interested in. And it felt like there was kind of a lot of it. And I felt like it was um, it was like a bit too much of a plot point. I really didn't buy the idea that um, that Calvin Evans would move to Commons, California, uh, just because the weather was great and not take all of those other, um, you know, jobs. And I guess you could argue that maybe he was going because he maybe thought Wakely would be there. I don't, I don't know how you're going to um, really, uh, you know, accept that as like an important plot point. I myself was like, I don't know. This seems like a little bit of a, um, a something that the author has to have happen in order to have all of these people end up back together. Um, and interacting in each other's lives. But so it, it felt a bit thin to me. And the rowing part of the book also felt like a little bit, there was a little, just a little too much emphasis. But on 165, we had this very satisfying pacing um, that made me very happy. So this is when um, her obstetrician, uh, Dr. Mason, has convinced her to come out and row with them. 
And um, we get, they're, they're like getting ready to go and they're walking out. And so we have this space break. So the doctor says, let's get going then. He tipped his head at the coxswain. And then we have a space break and it says, I think that went well, don't you? Dr. Mason said later as they walked to their cars. And I literally wrote, thank God, because I really was not wanting it to hear like a long thing about how the rowing went with Elizabeth Zott, you know, out with these people and sort of like getting back on the horse and whatnot. I just was like, oh my God, no, like, please don't have it be like a long rowing thing. So when he says, I think that went well, don't you? You, it's so great because you've had this space break and in in that space break is when they have done their rowing and whatnot. And I was so happy. I was like, Bonnie Garma's excellent, excellent pacing there. I really was not um, in the mood for a lot more rowing. This is a, an example of kind of a different type of pacing than what I was just talking about. And it's also the excellent end of a chapter. This is on page 91. This is when Calvin is going to take um, 6.30 on the walk. He turned back, grabbed the leash, bent down, and clipped it to 630's collar. Securely connected to the dog for the first time, Calvin turned and locked the door behind him. He was dead 37 minutes later. This was a real page-turning, uh, kind of cliffhangery ending for me. I mean, if you were planning on putting this down and, like, going and making dinner, kind of a coincidence that I said that, but, you know, I've got cooking and dinner on the mind. Oh, my God, there's an ant crawling on my book. Gross, gross. Sorry. Um... So this it's, it's a bold move to, to say what's going to happen as the cliffhanger, but I really love that because I am always a fan of knowing what's gonna happen. This is why I don't care about spoilers. I also have such a bad memory and I don't care about like watching trailers and seeing too much or having someone tell me what happens at the end because often I am more interested in how something happened than I am in, you know, the actual fact of it having happened. I'm also very interested in um, the aftermath. There are a few writers, um, Gabrielle Zevin is one um, who wrote Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Uh, she says herself that she's very interested in writing about sort of after I think that's right. I think I might be confusing her with someone else. But there is this idea um, that's a really excellent idea, actually, of like after something has happened, sort of what what is it? What, what does the aftermath look like? OK, now that we've covered the pacing, we're going to move on to the excellent prose. So there are a bunch of different things that I think Garmus does really well, and I'm just going to pull out a few of them. One is this idea of this chemical knowledge that we are um, given. And there's not a lot of this, thank goodness, in the book, or maybe not thank goodness, I might have liked a little more, um, but I really thought it was so well done and it really stood out as a, as a sort of a piece of the book that really, it made it feel less thin and a little richer and it gave a certain amount of authority and sort of depth to Elizabeth Zott as a character. So when she's talking about chemistry, she really does seem like she knows what she's talking about. And it doesn't, I got the sense, I mean, I wasn't surprised that Bonnie Garmus has worked in, you know, technology and I don't know, medicine or something. I don't know. She's done a bunch of different scientific kind of things. Um, but on 168, we have a very good example of the way that chemistry uh, enters into the novel and really adds a lot. This was a very sort of um, a small example. It's not even really like any sort of sophisticated chemistry, but it was just kind of a nice way that, that a scientific perspective um, was sort of uh, made the book, I think, feel a bit richer. 25 minutes later, she walked into the Hastings lobby, hands shaking, skin clammy, the body's warning system sounding all alarms. I loved that because it wasn't like a really heavy handed description, but it was this nice way of, of sort of letting us know that she thinks about things in these scientific terms. I really loved the part when she was discussing the different bonds when she was talking to the women and she had some really great metaphors about how like ionic bonds are, you know, I can't remember now, but there's covalent and she had these different things about marriage and bonds. And I really liked the idea um, of, of kind of spinning out this metaphor that, that allows Elizabeth to, to really show off both her chemistry uh, knowledge, but also make it very accessible for the women who are watching the show. And and of course, also as uh, someone who is uh, reading the book. This someone who is reading the book, I will um, remind you, I got a C plus in chemistry in high school, like on my report card, because I totally forgot to turn in my lab notebook. But 
let's just say I was not heading for an A. I mean, I just don't, I love the idea of like surfactants and I love like the practicality that like the reason that aluminum foil works the way that it does is because it has like the specific heat capacity is either like higher or lower or whatever. So you can touch, you know, aluminum foil in your oven that's at 325 and it's not gonna burn you because some magical chemical thing is happening in there. So I, I love the idea of chemistry in our lives. And I think that this book does a very good job of developing some of them. I liked the idea of this like afternoon depression um, w in terms of television watching, you know, this idea that circadian rhythms make it so that we, we are, you know, ready in the afternoon to have someone babysit our children when we are our age. I distinctly remember coming home from school and watching, you know, the Flintstones and whatever was on after the Flintstones. Um, you know, there were those sort of two hours of television. And I, I, I do, as a child, remember loving it, but I'm sure that um, perhaps the moms loved it even more than we did. So it's, it's a, um, I love the way that science is kind of feathered throughout the book, not in a heavy handed way, but in one uh, that I think adds some authority and, and some kind of like credulity. I think her chapter endings are another strength throughout the book. Sometimes they were a little bit too pat. Like I got the feeling it f felt like a little bit too wrapped up in a bow, but some of them were really excellent. I just kind of at random picked a few here. Um, it's very easy to do because all of them, I found that they were either like really good or like a little too much. Um, but I think that's the sign of someone who is like generally pretty good at ending chapters. So this is um, when at one point um, when she is concluding her uh, her show, she said, this concludes your introduction to chemistry, she announced, class dismissed. So you have this sense here um, of, of her as running like a real educational program. And it's really very, um, it, it's, it's a very good way to end the chapter. On 370, we have Elizabeth saying, sorry, Donati, she said, handing him a pen. You're just not smart enough. So this is one of these, I mean, this is toward the end of the book when things are really winding up and she's kind of getting her, um, you know, her vengeance or her revenge or whatever, however we want to think about it. But it's very strong to end the chapter that way. It's really uh, adding a little emphasis to her victory. Then on page 377, I really loved this one. So this is when, when th we're realizing uh, who in fact Avery Parker is. I think we may have guessed beforehand, but this is, um, it's a very sweet ending to this chapter. I'm Calvin Evans's biological mother, Avery Parker said slowly, her gray eyes filling with tears. And with your permission, Miss Zott, I'd very much like to meet my granddaughter. I found that so sweet. Um, maybe a little schmaltzy, but I don't know, it totally worked for me. And I am not generally someone who likes kind of sweet things like this, but I really found that very effective. You can understand why chapter endings are important. You know, you're really, the whole chapter is kind of leading toward this and, and sort of just in terms of how, you know, the visual works, you're moving toward the end and then you have this blank space and often that's when we will put the book down. So there is, or sometimes we're not able to because the chapter ending is so good, um, but you have this sense of, of, of finality and a sense of kind of winding things up in a way that is very satisfying almost throughout the entire novel. Another aspect I really enjoyed are these kinds of summaries that we had occasionally. So you all know that I generally don't read for plot and you know that my memory is not great. And I read this book, oh, sorry, clanging. I read this book very quickly. So I don't even really have an excuse for not remembering, um, you know, what was going on. But even when I do remember, I like it when an author gives us kind of like a little summary of what has been going on, partly because it's helpful to have someone jarring my memory jogging my memory, but also um, it's very helpful because I'm always interested to see which elements the author pulls when they do these kinds of little summaries. So when we look on 348, so this is Miss Frask. Um, I have to say that there were a number of different times in the book where I found um, the coincidences just being too heavy handed. The fact that, um, you know, Wakely, the Reverend, is also uh, the pen pal or the fact that Trask I'm, I'm a, oh, spoiler alert, just spoiled something. I hope that uh, you weren't disappointed I just said that. But we have um, Trask being both, you know, the person at Hastings and then also being Wakely's, uh, you know, temp 
uh, typist. So th there are a bunch of different sort of, uh, you know, a bunch of different coincidences that really did not work for me. I think lots of times in work, uh, in literature, you are meant to suspend disbelief. You know, magical realism, for example, is a very good, uh, a very good example of a piece of writing where you're meant to understand and to look for patterns of meaning that that don't depend on you having a like a very believable story. But in a story like this, that's meant to be sort of, um, you know, this is not a fantastical story by any stretch. But there are these, um, and and there's some elements where. It seemed a little over the top and I it was kind of okay with me because I kind of imagined it actually as a television adaptation and one that was very stylized or one where we had these kinds of, um, you know, there, there would have been sort of visual ways to kind of, you know, give a little wink or have it be a little bit tongue in cheek. But I have to say there were also other times where these coincidences just seemed a bit much for me. But here we have Trask, who, again, I found it a bit um, overly coincidental that she was Wakely's typist, but I really appreciated this little summary that she provides for us. What happened, Frask thought. Well, I spread vicious rumors about your mother, which culminated in her firing, which led directly to her state of penury, which led to an eventual return to Hastings, which led to your mother screaming at me in the women's bathroom, which led to the discovery that we'd both been sexually assaulted, which led to our inability to get our PhDs, which led to unfulfilling careers in a company led by a handful of incompetent assholes. That's what happened. So I love this. Again, this is a very good example, not only of like a really nice kind of synthesis, but one where it's really important, the things that that Trask here is is sort of picking out. Trask? Is it Trask or Frask? Oh my God, it's Frask. Um, Frask, Trask, you know. Um, but it's, it's a very good example of one where she is highlighting certain things and adding weight and emphasizing and reminding us in a way that is very effective. There are a few of those, a few of those summaries throughout the, the novel that I find uh, very well done. Okay, and then some of the humor in the book, it was not a book that I found particularly, uh, like it wasn't clever in um, the way that uh, like my favorite kind of humor is, but I did find um, a couple of instances. This one is an example of something that I found funny, um, and then I have to say that Garmas like took it too far, just went a little far. So let's look on page 210. In this passage, Elizabeth is talking to Walter Pine, who is her boss at the television show, and they are talking about uh, the, the girl's teacher, uh, Amanda and Madeline's teacher. So Walter says, she's suspicious of me because I'm a father raising a daughter alone. Why? He looked surprised. Why do you think? Oh, she said with sudden understanding, she believes you're sexually deviant. So I thought that was so funny, partially because you're like, um, are they going to kind of tiptoe around this or what? But it is so funny to me. Again, this is that kind of awkward, kind of weird prickliness that we see in Elizabeth Zott throughout the book, this very kind of just like stating things. But I also think it's so funny. She believes you're sexually deviant. There's something about sexually deviant that I just loved. I just thought that was so good. Then I have to say, uh, I felt like Garmus went a little bit too far here. Elizabeth starts talking about the sex that she's had with Calvin and how great it was. So she says, I guess we're both suspect then, Elizabeth said. Calvin and I had sex nearly every day, completely normal for our youth and activity level. But because we weren't married, uh, Walter said, paling, well, as if marriage has anything to do with sexuality. Uh, there were times that I would wake up in the middle of the night filled with desire. And so she's going on and on about these things. Um, and then she uh, says, it wasn't until I did more reading on testosterone that I better understood the male sex drive. Speaking of drive, Walter interrupted his face scarlet. I wanted to remind you to park in the north lot. So it's like, then I was like, oh, oh, Bonnie Garmus has gone just a bit too far. I really enjoyed the sexually deviant thing. And then um, like Walter's discomfort as Elizabeth was speaking so frankly about her sex life, just, it just got to be like a little too cute or something. There were times when, and this is the, the problem with the 60, with the 630, or um, there was some other, at the very end of the book, there's a coincidence like that. Like, it, she has this thing of, like, when people say one thing, it's misinterpreted as something else, in that case, um, as the name of the dog, or the name of her child, when she says she's mad, um, right after giving birth, and they said that the baby's name was mad. Um, those kinds of, like, 
mishearing things that turn into names doesn't really work for me. And this is another example of that sort of thing. When she's saying, speaking of sex drive, and then he like starts talking about driving uh, in the parking lot, it just seems a little too cute to me on some level. We're gonna move on now to talk uh, sort of briefly about the feminism in the book. We're gonna cover the weaknesses and then we're gonna close. I already mentioned what an excellent job uh, Bonnie Garmus does of repurposing the domestic. So we have the kitchen, in the home that is repurposed into a lab that's a working lab and that is also in fact um, a uh, uh, a place of employment for Elizabeth. She's not making a lot of money but she's essentially turning the lab into a source of income. Also, um, you know, you have this cooking show, which is, a, it's a very sort of domestic thing that is being put out into the public world in a way that's really great. Like she's sort of parlaying um, her love of something that is very domestic, which is cooking, which also happens to be chemistry. And she's making that into a, a, a living. So we have this nice kind of melding of um, the public and the private and the domestic and the professional in these ways that are really great. Um, I also really liked um, some of the time when uh, actually a lot of the book is a discussion of how difficult things are for women. And it was it was a really good reminder. Um, I mean, honestly, we have really not come as far as we should have come, but it was a good reminder of, of some of the ways in which things have gotten better. On 178, we actually touched on this briefly before in that excellent kind of roundup uh, that Frask did. But this is a, um, I found this a very powerful passage, uh, this one on 178 in the novel, because there, there's some sort of infighting that you're seeing among um, the women in the book between Elizabeth and Frask in particular, which seems very typical, uh, or not typical, but it's sort of one of the terrible byproducts of women being some, somewhat scarce in the workplace and being insecure about their positions and feeling like there's some sort of scarcity of resource and, 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 and just being competitive with one another in general. So you have this kind of infighting that's happening. And then we have this kind of spectacular uh, ending of chapter chapter 21 on page 178. Frask says, I didn't have a chance to finish, okay? What about you? Why aren't you a PhD? Elizabeth hardened and without meaning to revealed a fact about herself that she'd never told anyone other than a police officer. Because I was sexually violated by my thesis advisor, then kicked out of the doctoral program, she shouted. You? Frask looked back, shocked. Same, she said limply. Okay, so I found that very powerful. I also found same um, was highly anachronistic in my opinion. Um, I did mark that. Also, um, it really, in my mind, would have been more powerful for her to say same, she said, period, or even just same, period. I do not think we need limply. So we are going to get to um, Bonnie Garmus's use of adverbs in, in when we talk quickly about some of the weaknesses in the novel. But I really, I really liked um, how kind of explosive and spectacular this was, but there is throughout a lot of attention paid to the many, many difficulties of women in the workplace. Okay, so um, there also though um, is some really inspirational passages. I found this so inspirational, which is funny to me because it is very on the nose and um, you know, you could argue that it was like a little bit cheese ball, but I really ate it up. So this is on 360. Again, we're toward the end of the book here. Um, this is when she is deciding that she's going to leave the cooking show, which um, is really, it's just an excellent turn. I think that Bonnie Garmas did an amazing job with the with the, the sort of character arc of Elizabeth Zott. I'm not gonna go into it because uh, I don't wanna spoil too much for people um, if they're not quite finished with the novel, but I really do think um, th I was relieved that the uh, story arc went the way that it did. So this is, um, she is talking about one of the women who was inspired by the show to go on uh, to medical school. This is Elizabeth speaking. The hard part wasn't returning to school, but rather having the courage to do so. She strode to her easel, marker in hand. Chemistry is change, she wrote. Whenever you start doubting yourself, she said, turning back to the audience, whenever you feel afraid, just remember, Courage is the root of change, and change is what we're chemically designed to do. So when you wake up tomorrow, make this pledge. No more holding yourself back. No more subscribing to others' opinions of what you can and cannot achieve. And no more allowing anyone to pigeonhole you into useless categories 
of sex, race, economic status, and religion. Do not allow your talents to lie dormant, ladies. Design your own future. When you go home today, ask yourself what you will change, then get started. I loved this. I loved it. I ate it up, ate it up. And I really did. I was like, oh my God, oh wait, I do have some talents. And wait, wait, I mean, on a personal note, I am someone who has really prioritized the domestic and have really dedicated myself to uh, being a really um, superlative wife and mother. And in lots of ways, I feel like I have sort of shortchanged myself professionally. I'm, I'm happy about the decisions that I have made, certainly, and I'm very invested in my role uh, you know, on the home front. But at 54, I'm really, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling inspired. And I really appreciate Bonnie Garmus having just given us that little pep talk about like what it is you want to change, you know, stop thinking about it, get out there and do the thing, do the thing. So I really, I really thought that was excellent. And, you know, it's it, feminism in books, I think sometimes can feel uh, like dark and difficult. And there are lots of dark and difficult parts here. Um, and we, again, haven't come as far as we might have liked. But I, um, I did find the book very inspirational. Okay. And then um, I want to finish this I, this sort of discussion of feminism by talking about the not just the character arc, but um, right from the start, like the the Elizabeth Zott character is is unique and is I think very inspirational um, and, and sort of revolutionary. Partly because she again is not that likable, but also because I mean I say she's not likable. She's definitely likable. She's inspirational. But like, is she someone? like I want to hang out with all day long not really like I don't I can't even imagine her like loosening up and having a glass of wine and like laughing or anything um not that that's that important but like a little bit um but so aside from whether or not she's likable she is a single mother she never wanted to have children she was not wanting to get married because it was going to sideline her career she um as she is raising her child she's not re relying on a male partner for her finances and certainly not you know in helping raising the child so she has another woman in her life who is a very helpful important uh person in terms of raising the child so it's sort of these two women who are raising Madeline together and you end up having this very kind of unconventional family which is really beautiful and I like the fact that the book ends with that She's also a chemist and a scientist, which is, I mean, that in and of itself, I mean, we have more and more girls, um, you know, in STEM these days, but it is 2023. I mean, in 1961, I think this this emphasis of her as a chemist is, is really, I mean, it's a big statement when you think about it. Um, so, and I also, again, really love this idea of her giving up the domestic first in that she is, you know, eradicating her kitchen and making it into a laboratory. And then she also is going to, in fact, give up the cooking show and she's going to return to this really hardcore, very difficult, uh, uh, kind of abstruse topic that she's really impassioned by. And that is ultimately what she's dedicating herself to. So I, I really, not only um, was, was there sort of, you know, a lot of lips not lip service there was a lot of like descriptions of of you know both the trials and tribulations of this single woman but it really felt very uh you, you, not just the story arc but all of the different attributes that we love in elizabeth zott are all in fact uh very good embodiments of what it is to really be a, a, a serious feminist okay so we're going to walk quickly through some of these kind of, you know, things that I found slightly lacking in the novel, and then we are going to look at the clothes. So as I mentioned before, there are a couple of um, Britishisms that we see throughout, just a couple, but I was like, oh my gosh, um, that feels to me directly like Bonnie is, um, you know, like sitting in a pub overhearing someone talking. There were quite a few anachronisms, which I think most people just don't probably really care about that, but they they, they stuck out a bit for me. Um, figurative language, sometimes her figurative language was so good. Um, at one point she was talking about, she felt an avalanche of love for her child, and it was, it was very effective and very good and very sweet. But there were other times where, wow, I mean, there was just some figurative language that was so, um, just kind of over the top or cliche or just not necessary. And sometimes we'd have like several different uh, metaphors or similes all in the same paragraph, 
that weren't necessarily competing, but I just was like, oh gosh, like we do not need so much figurative language. Most of the figurative language that Bonnie Grammis uses is, um, you know, comparisons, analogies. So either metaphors uh, or similes. And honestly, you guys all know I'm very picky. I have very high standards about figurative language. I would rather have someone not use any then use one that either feels heavy handed or feels kind of random or feels cliche. So I did feel like there was a bit too much of that. Um, so she uses lots of adverbs. There are so, so, so many adverbs in this book. And um, I think most people probably wouldn't notice that. But what I will say is that if the editor had gone through and had gotten rid of all these adverbs, no one would have missed them. And frankly, every single, not every single, I can't say that, but I would, I would bet good money that in every case, uh, if you had a stronger verb or even just kept the verb that she chose and got rid of the adverb, the reader is smart enough and the context is good enough and the dialogue is well done. So I don't think you need all of these adverbs that are everywhere. Um, I have this problem with the word impossibly. So a lot of people, they'll be like, oh, you know, it was an impossible, he was impossibly tall. It's always this kind of like, um, uh, it, you know, like it's a, it's totally unnecessary. It's like, they'll like, I think she's talking about the oars that they were impossibly long or something. There's just this, this use of impossibly as an adverb that is so annoying to me. This has been the case. I noticed it. Um, actually when I was at Bennington, so that was, I don't know, gosh, probably 10 years ago now. Um, and I just noticed that like all the kind of hipster writers at one point, there would always be the use of impossibly as an adverb, you know, it was impossibly, uh, impossibly difficult or no, it wasn't even that good. It was like, it was impossibly moving or it was impossibly dark or it was impossibly, um, I don't know. It was impossibly... I can't think of an example. So every time I would read and I'd be like, okay, there it is. There is the impossibly. Well, I have to say that Bonnie Garmus uses impossibly as an adverb three times within the span of nine pages from page 63 to 72. And I saw it the first time and I circled it and was like, no, with like 10 different O's. And then it was again and again. And I was like, oh no, oh Bonnie. Um, but so let's look at pages 70 and 71 just briefly. And and my point here is that, um, you, you know, Bonnie's writing, Bonnie Garmus's writing is, is good enough that I really don't think she needs all these adverbs. So we're gonna look at pages 70 and 71 as an example of, of how she does not need to be, we don't, we don't need it. The reader doesn't need it. We get it. Um, so I've actually circled um, adverbs and some of these adjectives that I also don't think. Um, so Donati had had incredible misfortune. I just think if she had said the, um, had the misfortune to row against him once, I just think it's stronger. Um, oh, here it is. Um, she glimpsed something over a sea of impossibly big hats. No, impossibly big hats? No, no. Um, and then, actually, I'm going to read the whole sentence. Um, their catastrophic loss, seven boat lengths, witnessed only by a handful of people who'd managed to glimpse it over a sea of impossibly big hats, was carefully blamed on some fish and chips they'd ingested, blah, blah, blah. Carefully blamed, impossibly big hats? No, 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 no. Um, and then down here a little bit further, Evans accepted the incredibly insulting Hastings offer. I mean, I just think insulting would have been better. Um, Donati wasn't overly enthusiastic. Um, I just don't think we need that. Um, he happened to be the man's godson and certainly not because he was married. We don't need it. And not because he was married. We don't need certainly. Um, we have um, purposely showed up 20 minutes late. I mean, I can guarantee you this sentence would have been better if and showed up late. Like, it's insulting. We know that's insulting. Purposely showed up late. Like, I just, I, we, we know that. That's in the context. It's understood. Unfortunately, to an empty conference room, blah, blah, blah. I mean, oh my gosh. Socially, deemed socially and physically appropriate. Um, obviously, she couldn't possibly be rowing with Evans. I mean, wow. There are like 25 adverbs in on pages 70 and 71. So 
my point is that, again, Garmus's writing is strong enough and th that it would have only been aided if someone had gone through and stripped out all of those adverbs. Um, I will also say that, um, so one of the parts that I had a little trouble with in this book um, is that Bonnie Garmus really enjoys using a lot of different words to describe people speaking in dialogue. Her dialogue is so good. The dialogue is excellent, but then the glosses which are usually like he said or she said or whatever. And so the, the sort of writerly, um, you know, thinking is that you want that to just go away. If you're James Joyce or, um, you know, a lot of really talented other people, Cormac McCarthy, for example, you don't have any glosses. You don't need them because you're writing your, um, you know, you don't even have quotation marks. Like your dialogue is so strong and it is totally unmistakable. It's impossible to take it um, as anybody else uh, who is speaking there. So if you have really strong dialogue, and I do think Garmus's is good, you don't need these glosses. But so she has a lot of um, adverbs. So it would be like, he said, exhaustedly, maybe not quite like that, but like um, we just had an example of Frask who said something limply. Like we didn't, we definitely, definitely didn't need that. So we have lots of adverbs um, that that are that are put into these glosses. But in addition to that, um, we have a lot of words that are used instead of said. And almost every, every single time, I would argue that in fact, Bonnie Grimes would be better off having just said said. So here, I had to make a list because I literally just started glancing through and I was really, um, impressed in, in kind of a um, shocked but not a great way by all of these different uh, words that she managed to get in here. So again, instead of said, she has interrupted, moaned, quavered, uh, reacted. What does that even say? Persisted, yelled, explained, called out, chirped, warned, contributed, pressed, replicated no i still can't re i cannot read this reacted i can't read my own writing here gasped murmured stuttered exhaled i mean it goes on and on and on so uh, i will i will say that um once you notice that kind of thing it's a little tricky to kind of unnotice it but i just kept thinking oh gosh just maybe the next book if bonnie garmus is going to go on and write again um, maybe maybe an editor will just just be like, let's just go with said. You just want that stuff to go away. And again, her dialogue is strong enough that we don't need murmured or gasped or stuttered. Um, it, we just don't. There also, she was doing a thing where she, um, when somebody was saying like, please, it would be like PLPL. -PL. And so it sounded like everybody was actually stuttering and it's throughout the whole thing. Like, it'd be like, excuse me. And it would be like, Ex excuse me. And I'm like, wait, does everyone in the book have a stutter? So I think there was a better way to punctuate that um, than than what, Gar what Garmus was up to. Okay. Um, and then last, oh, the last thing I have on my, my list here of the things that didn't quite sit as well with me is this idea of, of things sometimes being kind of over the top. But I did get to a place where I was kind of imagining a certain type of television that we actually see a lot of these days that I really enjoy, where it's very stylized and sort of things happen that seem a little over the top, but because it's so stylized and so well done and consistent in the televising, you kind of, um, it's like fine. Like there's a way to make it feel kind of campy or stylized where um, you understand that people know it's a little over the top. So when I would get to a place where I'd feel like Garmus had gone a little over the top, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna imagine this in a very stylized, campy kind of television thing. And that really worked for me. Okay, now we are finally going to look at the very close of the novel. I really liked the close. I liked the fact that it ended on the dog. You know that I'm a big dog person. Although I have to say um, it was a bit thin um, and it was another one of these um, ideas that I think by now you know. I wasn't really that wild about the dog being named 630. And um, we have another example of this in here that I don't really love. The rest of the ending I think is excellent, but I did find that a bit too cute. So um, I'll just say that right at the top that um, there, there was a part here uh, that felt a little bit too cute to me, but mostly I, I enjoyed the ending. Okay, I'm basically just going to read this last couple of characters. I mean, <laughs> paragraphs to you. Um, so this is when um, Elizabeth is uh, making a plan with Avery Parker. 
Let's say separate six then, Elizabeth said, not wanting her to go. The home lab. Everyone, you, Wilson, Mad, 630, me, Harriet, Walter. You'll need to meet Wakely and Mason at some point too. The whole family. Avery Parker, her face suddenly familiar with Calvin's smile, turned back and took Elizabeth's hands in her own. The whole family, she said. As the door closed behind them, Elizabeth bent down and took 630's head in her hands. Tell me, how soon did you know? At 241, he wanted to say, which is what I planned to call her. But instead, he turned and jumped up on the opposite counter and grabbed a fresh notebook. Removing the pencil from her hair, she took it from him, then opened to the first page. A biogenesis, she said. Let's get started. I love it. I love it. I think it's an excellent ending. I love the fact that the book is ending with this idea of let's get started. I just think it's so great. I also don't know if I uh, just pronounced a biogenesis. Abiogenesis? I think it's a biogenesis. I don't know. Um, but I really... I'm very happy to have dug into this book with you all. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed it. I'm also now so, so ready to uh, start watching, watching some television. And I will be getting back to you all with my thoughts on the adaptation and the different directions um, and the different emphases. Curious about the dog. Curious about a lot of different things. So um, stay tuned in the future for a uh, an episode about the television series lessons in chemistry, but thank you so much for tuning in um, and getting a good look at the pantry. By the way, I'm just realizing this is like some serious product placement by um, Tostitos over here. Sadly, I don't have any sponsors yet. I'm waiting for the sponsors to start rolling in, um, but in the meantime, there's some product placement for uh, for Tostitos. I decided I was not going to um, touch anything in the pantry, but note you, we are in here because it is the beginning of December and my kitchen is not looking good. Um, also, I'm just gonna put in a little plug here. Who gives a crap is um, a line of bamboo toilet paper and uh, a line of, uh, what is this, paper towels. I love them. They come in these really cute wrappings like this and the toilet paper comes in the cutest. It's just so great, it's so great. It's delivered to your door in boxes and it is excellent toilet paper and um, it is totally sustainable. Who gives a crap? Check it out. I'm doing some advertising for them. They don't even know it yet, but um, that's just from the goodness of my heart because it's good for the planet. Okay, so after, um, after you are finished with this, head back to the Fox page, listen to something else, and uh, happy holidays. Happy reading. <laughs>